Good evening, everyone. How you doing? My name is Lee Love, and uh, thanks for joining. This is Photo Mentor TV. We're here every Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Pacific. If you're uh, in other parts of the world, that would be 0200 Universal Coordinated Time. Uh, we're on YouTube and Facebook. You can get to us there. And again, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, first of all, let me uh, start off by an apology. I have a little bit of congestion tonight, so if I have to mute my microphone, you'll know why. Um, I'll try not to choke or uh, go, you know, and then fall off the the uh, camera position here. Anyway, um, thanks for for joining us. Anyway, I, if you're watching on the replay, it's always uh, great to have you here. Also, and uh, this is the place where you can ask your questions for all things photography related try to uh, target it really or orient it more toward new photographers because I think they're the ones that are struggling the most with trying to find information and get accurate information. Anyway, um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is the last live broadcast for 2020. Uh, boy, it's been a weird and uh, tough year for many of us, uh, but I hope you're doing well. hope you're doing well health-wise, financially. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, um, it's one thing I've learned. It is that the human race is very, um, adaptable. We tend to, if, you know, no matter what's going on, we tend to adapt to that over the years. And I think we'll get through this just as well. Anyway, um, in a minute, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the goals for 2021. What I, some things I think you should think about and, uh, talk about that in a minute, but if you've never been here before, the purpose of this uh, broadcast is really to educate, encourage, and mentor, and primarily, again, new photographers. Um, there's a lot of um, misinformation out there, and that's what started this for me, is to really try and correct some of the myths and misinformation I see promoted or repeated over and over again. And it just kind of drove me crazy. And so this is my attempt to try and correct those, uh, those issues. I don't know everything. I'll tell you when I don't know something. And if I don't know it, I can either figure it out or find the information. Um, or I'll refer you to somebody else. But uh, anyway, it's a lifelong learning experience. I've been doing this a long time, many decades. And so I think I can help most of you uh, and answer your questions. My goal is really to see you grow. Uh, gain more confidence and really succeed in your photography, whatever that may be, however you measure success. It could be just in your creative endeavor. It might be in uh, financially. Maybe you want to turn this into a business. So uh, I hope this is, um, this is beneficial to you. Uh, the way you can support um, this broadcast and the, the, my efforts is I would really appreciate if you would uh, like the page, the photomentor.tv page. Um, and share this really if you have other photographers and other groups and things it would be a tremendous help if you would share these um, videos with them to help them out because i think it would answer a lot of questions that they have that i my life's questions are things i see repeated over and over in many many uh forums and groups so i know that there's a need out there um let's see um again if you're joining us for the first time the uh, way you get to this broadcast or this page is you can go to uh, facebook.photomentor.tv. And it's a URL. W, you don't have to go www.http. And then you can, or you can go directly to YouTube by going to youtube.photomentor.tv. And then that's a short URL. You don't have to type a bunch of stuff in. It'll take you right to the video. So, anyway, um, to uh, answer your questions, the, um, there's a, I appreciate if you, you can leave a comment in either the, on the YouTube channel or on the Facebook channel or on the Facebook uh, comment section. And if you put a Q in there, it'll show up on my screen here and I'll be able to uh, bring your question online and uh, answer that for you. And, uh, so again, ask any question you want and, uh, think, uh, do our, do my best to try and answer those questions for you. Um, let's see here. What else? Um, I think that's about it. Um, if you have quite, if you want to leave questions or, uh, and you want to put something, ask a question that is in your, as you're watching this on the replay, if you want, you can send an email to help 
at photomentor.tv, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible, try and reply to that directly, or we'll put it on next week's show. Um, so let's see. Um, one of the th- I want to make an announcement tonight, and one of the things that um, I, I asked a question a couple weeks ago, the first of the month, about what was the single issue that you were struggling with as a photographer? And the answers were very, they weren't really surprising, actually. I kind of expected what they were going to say. Um, the thing that made me, that it really excited me was though, that every single question or every single issue people were struggling with, I knew I could help them with. And that was really because, uh, you know, I want to be able to help people. I want to be able to, as I said before, succeed as a photographer. So being able to uh, see that they, these are the kinds of questions they're asking um, was uh, kind of really made me feel good that I know I can help uh, a number of people. One of the biggest topics, one of the biggest issues that people are struggling with over and over and over again, about four of them that were at the top, but one of the ones that was like one or two was editing. And a lot of people are having trouble with trying to figure out editing and how to edit their images and that type of thing. Um, a lot of people are asking about software and stuff like that, but I'd say the majority of people are using Adobe Lightroom. So what I have decided to do is in next month in January, I am going to do a free, um, workshop, um, on Lightroom. It'll be, um, uh, I'll send you the details on it. You can, but you can register for the workshop. It's no cost to you guys. It'll be free. It'll be live. So I'll crash and burn. You'll probably see me make lots of mistakes. But anyway, uh, the um, it'll be sometime in January. I haven't picked a date yet, but uh, there will probably be a way you can replay it if you miss it. But if you uh, the, some of the topics I'll be talking about, I have a feeling that I may have to do more than one of these because it's a big topic. It's a big product and there's a lot of tri- things you can learn. Um, but, um, one of the biggest is image management, uh, teach you a little bit about how to manage your images, how they're stored in a catalog, uh, how not to lose them, which is the biggest problem people have. I do a lot of one-on-one training and support for Lightroom users. I've been doing this for years. And, uh, I'd say the biggest problem people have is knowing where their images are and what do you do? Don't panic when you get that exclamation point at the top of the right hand of the, of the thumbnail saying that your photos are missing. So I'll talk to you about him. I'll show you a little bit about image management, um, some storage, some best practices. I'll talk to you about disk space and how you do this and where you store your images and some things that I've uh, helped clients with before that'll, I think make your life a lot easier. We'll go over some basic editing techniques and things like that. Obviously in an hour or so we can't do everything, but I want to get you started on the right foot. And then the fourth thing we want, I want to go over is uh, exporting how you get the stuff out of there. How do you put a watermark on your image? Maybe, um, some things like that. So there may be more of these. This is just a few of the f- topics I came up with to start with. Um, I'm sure we'll, this will expand as we get going, but if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to take advantage of this again, it'll be available only in January. So there's a limited time. I don't know how many slots I'm going to have available, but if you will go to photo, mentoracademy.com and put your name and email address in there. Um, I don't, I, I didn't have time to create a page specifically for this event. So this is kind of a generic page uh, that you're going to see. It's going to look some, it's going to look like this right here. Uh, but don't worry about it. Just put your name in there and you, you know, um, and then I will notify you with more details about the workshop and how you get uh, how you join it and when it's going to be and the date and that kind of thing. But I'd love to see as many of you there. I'd love to help as many of you as I can. So if you're a, um, thinking about becoming or a struggling, um, Adobe Lightroom user, this is probably the place you want to be. Now I should mention that I will only be doing this on Adobe Lightroom classic. I don't use CC. Um, and so I'm not as familiar with it. It's CC is really kind of a dumbed down version of classic and it just doesn't have the power and the capabilities that I need. And I think that, so I would encourage you if you are going to, if you already have Adobe Lightroom, then, um, I would suggest you go ahead and install or turn on the 
uh, classic version. That's what we'll be covering. So anyway, again, go to www.photomentoracademy.com. Put your name and ad, or your name and email in there, and I will notify you with more details in the next couple of weeks. But uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. And like I said, I've been a, a, a Lightroom user for many, many years, and there's always something new to learn. And uh, I spend a lot of time and uh, cost a lot of money, actually, to hire me to do one-on-one -on -one training. But I felt so much, I felt the need after looking at the responses that so many people really need help in this area that I genuinely wanted to kind of give back a little bit and see if I can get you guys off on the right foot. And I figured um, 2021 would be a good time to do that. Give me some time to get prepared. I'm also got some other things in the works to be able to help you out. Um, but this is the one I'm starting with right now. And I think it'll be uh, probably the most popular. So again, go to that URL um, and uh, put in your name and f an email address and I'll notify you when that is available. And uh, looking forward to it. I think it's going to be fun. I think you guys will really get a lot of uh, enjoyment out of it. And again, it'll be interactive. It'll be live. So you'll be able to ask questions um, and I'll do my best to answer them as many of them as possible. Okay. So what do we, so the other thing I want to do tonight is a little different is um, because this is the last live uh, broadcast of the year. I thought maybe it might be kind of interesting to go over some, um, some goals for 2021, not my goals, but some goals that you might want to use. Um, and, uh, so I came up with a couple that I wanted you to, to consider. Um, again, you have, everybody's different. You're unique. You have to figure out what's best for you. And I don't know where you are on your journey, but these are a couple of things to think about Four things to think about. If you haven't given this much thought, the first advice I'd give you is don't compare yourself to anybody else. I mean, yes, it's, you look at a lot of work and you can either get inspired or you can get depressed. Um, and I've been on both ends of that spectrum, but you know, you, you are unique. Your work is going to be different than anybody else's. It should be. So it's okay to look at other people's work and, and be inspired by it, but don't compare yourself on where you are in your journey to somebody else. You're different. Your journey is different than mine. Um, you're not going to be taking the same path that somebody else is. So just Follow your own path on this kind of stuff and don't compare yourself. Um, I could go on and on about this, but I think you get the point of what I'm trying to tell you here. Um, the second thing is um, don't take photos, tell stories. This is the thing that really bothers me a lot about a lot of people's work I see. They're nice photos. Maybe they're technically accurate. Maybe they're not. But I've noticed that a lot of people are um are not trying to focus no pun intended on the story what's the most important thing in the story when i look at a frame and i'll talk about this one in the um in the uh, uh, lightroom editing uh, session that we're going to workshop we're going to do in january um first question i ask myself is, what's the most important thing in the frame who's the hero i call it now it doesn't have to be a person, a hero could be an object, a product or something like that. But what's the most important thing and where do I want people to look? Second thing is, you know, what do I want people to say? How am I trying to communicate this? We are not photographers. I mean, we do photography. We deliver our solutions via video or via photography, but we're storytellers and people are hiring us or should be to be storytellers. And that's where I want you to go. I want you to become a storyteller and I want to help you get there. So work on that. And again, if you have any questions, you can message me or whatever, and I'll be glad to help you on that. And, and um, But I want you to become a storyteller, not just taking pretty pictures. Um, the second thing is spend more time behind the camera and not in front of the computer. Um, I had a long discussion with somebody on one of the groups about presets and Lightroom and you know processing. Now, let me, let me be clear about this. I have been a Photoshop user for decades. I think I started with version 2.5. And so I've been a long, and I do, if you look at my work, you'll see there's a lot of post-processing involved in my own personal work. Not so much in my client work because it depends on what the message, what the story is I'm trying to tell there. But the point is 
if the image doesn't convey the story, if the image doesn't work, no amount of processing is going to fix that. So putting a preset that has some kind of, you know, you bought or that you made your own or something is fine, but that's not going to make a, a bad picture better. Okay. You really need to spend more time looking through that viewfinder and correcting the image before you take the picture. So for example, I see a lot of people that will, um, if I'll look at their image and if I can tell if they would have moved six inches to the left or six inches to the right, the picture would have been completely different. Maybe there was something sticking out of their head. Maybe there's something in the image they didn't want that shouldn't have been there. Maybe there was something they need to include there to help tell the story. The point is then they go back and they have to spend two or three hours in software in front of the computer fixing an image that they could have fixed in 30 seconds just by moving one way or the other or looking or getting down lower or getting up higher, whatever this case may be. So one of the tips that I tell people is right before you push that shutter, look at all four corners of the frame, left, right, bottom, lower left. Look at that frame. Is there anything in there you want to get rid of or that you want to include? And you say, oh, wow, you might just, if you just move just a little bit, it could make that image much, much stronger. So spend more time in front of the, behind the camera, trying to get the image right. I, I don't want to say get it right in, in camera. That's ideally what you want to try and do. You want to get as much as possible. You want to crop it. You want to frame it. You want to get it as, as much as possible in camera so that you're not spending all this time doing this work on the computer. Because let's face it, I don't think many of us got into photography to be computer jockeys. We got into photography because we want to create, we want to tell a story and, um, sitting in front of a computer does not necessarily do that. Now, if you're an illustrator, that's a different story. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is that you, you, you know, you, you're not making any money either. It, what happens? I see people say, Oh, I'll do a session for an hour for a hundred dollars. And then they spend three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, working on the processing these images by the time you're done and you look at your cost of your, your time, your cost of the equipment, your cost of software and your post-processing cost, you're really probably making the same much as the same amount as a burger flipper. No, no disrespect to burger flippers, but the point is that's not necessarily the dream job. That's not why you got into this. So spend a little more time behind the camera instead of in front of the computer. And I think you'll be a whole lot off, a whole lot better off. Okay. And the last one is, um, and this is a difficult one for me and that's avoid the gas. And if you're not familiar with what that means, that stands, that stands for gear acquisition syndrome. It's uh, something that affects most of us, uh, photographers and we have to have the newest lens or the newest camera, or if we buy this or we buy that, we'll be so much better off, better photographers. If we just have this new gear. I'm as guilty as anybody. Believe me, I'm, there's stuff I'm looking at right now. Oh, wow, I really need this lens. I need this. I need that. Although I have more stuff than I could possibly need. And the problem is when you get that, and you, at least for me, and I, oh, I'm just, I'm, you know, jonesing after this one piece of this one product. And I go out and I use it and I figure, and I realize, guess what? My pictures still suck. So guess what? It's not the equipment. It's me. So. I could have, I have many, many examples that I, I thought about putting them up tonight, but I don't want to do this. Many, many examples of people that would take amazing photos with cameras that you just wouldn't believe. Very, very basic, minimalistic cameras, lenses, old lenses, iPhones, whatever. So it's not about the equipment. It's about your vision, your scene, your storytelling. And then from there, your composition and your processing but it's not necessarily about the equipment. So don't get hung up on that. So anyway, those would be my suggestion for goals for 2021. You may have some yourself. You may have more of them, I'm sure. But um, those are some things I wanted to cover and hopefully that'll help you. All right, let's get into some questions tonight. Um, one of the things I thought we would do is um, I have some questions from those of you submitted or that are new questions, but also I thought, you know, I've been doing this now. We've been doing the live stream since July, I think 26 or something, July. Forgot when the date is. Um, and so I went back and I looked and I have over probably 500, 600, 800 questions. 
that I have from people. So why not go back and revisit some of those questions and we'll kind of answer some of those and then I'll get into some of the live ones. But uh, anyway, I thought that'd be kind of fun to do. Okay. So these are some of my favorites um, and very common ones that I see asked over and over. And that's why I selected them. So on July 31st, somebody on that show, we ask them, what is a lens hood, a lens hood or shade? What do they do? And will they make the outcome of your photos any better? Um, yes and no. Let me first of all describe what it is. A lens hood is um, something that goes around the hood, around the lens, okay? It comes off. Usually this is for, a, I think this is a 50 millimeter I have on here, 50 or 85. What is this? I can't read it. 50. 50 millimeter. So it's not much of a, it's not much of a lens hood. Um, so it goes on. And um, what it does is it serves two purposes. One, it protects the, it pre prevents the light from hitting the front of the glass because if it hits the front of the glass, see that reflection there? You can see in the, in the lens, that will reduce the contrast of your image. And also it can cause flare, which can be creative, but uh, mainly what it, the bad part about it is it will reduce the contrast and your image will look washed out a little bit. It's kind of like the analogy is like when you're driving down the, the street the sun hits your windshield and you kind of can't see. It's a sort of the same kind of a thing. Um, the other thing, though, the, and the reason I like lens hoods is they protect the lens. So if you're carrying this thing around on your hip and you're on with the strap and it hits something, you're going to hit the lens hood. You're not going to hit the lens. So that's going to protect the lens. Um, the other thing is you, most people don't know this, but these hoods nowadays don't screw on. There's a, they're what they call bayonet mount. You can also reverse that and you put it on backwards and therefore it makes it takes less room so you can put it in your your bag your um your camera bag and it will take up um less room than if you have it on there like this so anyway lens hood that's the purpose to make your photos any better i don't know you got to get the uh the 42 megapixel lens hood just kidding um the high definition lens hood no nope. so what they will do is they will help you so if you don't have if you have contrast or again if uh, the light's hitting the um, the front of the glass then that would be what would make it better or worse um again if you guys have any of your own questions uh, be sure and uh, put a cue in front of them and post them in facebook or um, youtube comment section and uh, they'll show up here on my screen and i'll be able to bring them on for you okay um next question um, is, um, uh, on this one was done. It was posted on August 7th. It says, I understand that you're supposed to be able to keep your ISO as you, you, you want to keep your ISO as low as possible, but is there a rule of thumb shutter speed aperture? Absolutely. This is an important one. And I see this over and over again, very frustrating, um, because people think you got to shoot at ISO 100, 200. Now, look, I came from the days of film. And, you know, ISO or what we used to call ASA in film days, just to kind of give you some history there. ASA or ISO was like 400 for Tri-X, black and white Tri-X. Um, that was pretty much the top end of the, uh, the uh, speed for film. And the other interesting thing is everything had to be shot at 400, the whole roll of film. You didn't have a choice. You can't do one frame at one, one at another. You could push it to 1600, which is two stops. If you were lucky and the talk about noise and grain is man, the, the grain was like rocks, but you're doing something and you needed that low light. That's the only thing you could really do. Um, so the point is a lot of us still suffer from this low ISO mentality that I got to shoot at 100, 200, but the camp modern cameras have gotten so much better that you can shoot at higher ISOs now and not suffer nearly as much. So here's the point though. People will accept noisy pictures if you want to call them that, but they won't accept blurry pictures. What that means is if you have, to, if you're shooting at too low of an ISO or too low of a shutter speed, you're going to get camera shake and camera shake is going to have the images are going to be blurred. And therefore there's nothing you can do about that. There's nothing you can do to fix it. You can just delete them. That's about it. But if you have a high, ISO image with some noise in it, then you can, there's some tools you can use to remove some of the noise and clean it up and make it better. So if it's a difference between not getting the picture and getting the picture, 
sh- crank up the ISO. If you have to shoot a 6400 or 12,800, whatever, 10,000, whatever the number is to get the shot, do it. Because the only people that really care, I know people are going to disagree with this, the only people that really care about noise are other photographers. They're the only ones I ever see comment on this stuff. Clients don't care. Clients care about, guess what? Emotion, storytelling. They look at the picture. Oh, they'll make you know that kind of a comment. Of, they'll see something if you've captured them or you've really revealed something about them. They don't see the noise. They don't care about the noise. It's not about the noise. So forget about that. And I predict, in fact, the, the, the ISO performances on these modern cameras are getting so good that at some point I predict that that's just going to even go away. It's not even going to be an issue. I've seen pictures at 10,000, 12,800 that look fantastic. So um, anyway, don't worry about that. The rule of thumb. <laughs> Sorry about that. The rule of thumb is for your shutter speed is you want to be at a shutter speed that's twice the focal length. So let's say if you're at a 50 millimeter lens, using a 50 millimeter lens and your handheld, of course, this is one tripod, everything changes handheld, then you want to be shooting at double. So that would be like one, one twenty-fifth of a second. And that's going to give you ability to handhold that, that image steady. Now, if you're shooting at a 200th of a, uh, uh, with a 200 millimeter lens, then you have to double that or, you know, so now you have to go to like one four hundred, one six fortieth of a second, somewhere around there, 500th of a second to be able to get a steady picture. When that happens though, that means that you have to change your ISO. That's what I was referring to. So change the ISO if you have to, don't worry about it. So anyway, I could go on and on about this, but um, we'll take up the whole show talking about exposure triangle and I don't want to do that, but the, um, that's the issue. And that's a very common question I get, I see over and over. Okay. The next one was, um, submitted on, uh, August 21st. And that one was, I'm trying to get sharp images of my cat walking towards me, but they're still fuzzy. What am I doing wrong? Well, first of all, your cat moves too fast, or maybe the cat's fuzzy. I don't know. Listen, it's funny. We all take pictures. We get a new lens, right? We want to see how sharp it is. What do we do? We aim it at our pets first thing. And you get this kind of look. Like, okay, I'm done already. Really? Do you have to keep taking my picture? At least I have a lot of those pictures. Um, the, the problem is the tracking. So there are two modes that your focusing system will work. One is single. You push the shutter button and it'll lock on and that'll stick there and it won't move. The other one is continuous, meaning when you hold the shutter down or the back button, however you set your camera setup, it will continuously focus. This is what I used in sports photography when I was doing sports photography for a living. So I want to be able to hold that button down and track, 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 focus, 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 fire, fire, fire. It's the same thing with the, the animal coming towards you or a runner or a person walking. You want that to be, so on a Nikon, it's called AF-C for autofocus continuous. And on the um, Canon, I believe it's called AI servo. Um, I think that's what it's called. Sorry, I'm not a Canon shooter. Um, so, um, but what happens is, well, then, as long as you have the shutter button down or the back button, then it will focus uh, continuously and track, and then it will d- work perfectly. So that's what the problem is there. So, but getting sharp pictures is always a challenge. That was probably one of the number that was also in the survey I was telling you about before. One of the top items people were having trouble is getting contins- con- getting consistently consistent, sharp, uh, uh, images. Um, again, um, if you're uh, just joining us, thank very much for uh, joining us tonight. This is the last broadcast, live broadcast for 2020. And um, if you um, want to ask a question, be sure and uh, leave a comment in the um, Facebook or the YouTube comment section. If you're, um, but if you are watching this on the replay, you can still ask questions. Just uh, go ahead and send an email to help at photomentor.tv, and I'll be glad to answer those questions for you, even if this is on the replay. Let me uh, remind you guys again that, um, again, on uh, in January, I'm going to be doing a special session, a special free workshop be, um, because of the uh, demand. I saw people asking for editing. That was one of their biggest challenges was editing. So um, we're on in January. I'm gonna be, I haven't given you, uh, come up with a date yet, but I will be announcing this. 
I'm going to do a free workshop on Lightroom. If you're struggling with Lightroom, this will be great for you. I'm going to cover image management, storage, um, some best practices, some basic editing and exporting tips and tricks, and a whole lot more. But um, if you want to, uh, this is free again. And if you want to register for this, be sure and go to photomentoracademy.com. Put in your name and email address, and I'll notify you with more details. I apologize. Again, I didn't get a chance to make up a special page, excuse me, just for this um, a workshop. But that generic page there will work, and I'll, I'll notify you when um, the uh, course, uh, the workshop is available. So, okay, let's get back to it now. Um, okay, so again, we're talking about our cat pictures here. We already answered that one. On September 4th, that, the question was, um, does anyone uh, not edit their photos? Oh, that's kind of ironic. I didn't know this one was coming up. Um, or is that a requirement in photography now? I used to do film and develop in the tank uh, in the dark room. This editing stuff is foreign to me. Hey, well, to find out who this person is and invite them to the workshop. Um, you know, photo processing, while I initially, when I talked about one of the goals was not to spend days in front of the computer, and I still hold to that, it is a part of the process. Again, this gentleman, meant, or I'd say gentleman, I don't know who it was a man or woman, but either one, the, um, in the days of doing film, we sent our film to the lab, they processed it, processed it or we processed it ourselves, and then we had to print it. So it's the same basic idea, except that we're now the lab. We don't, can't send our stuff off. You can, I mean, you can send your, your images off to be printed, of course, but most of the time, the processing is done by us. So we're, therefore, we're the lab now. And so I would say there are kind of two things that happen in the digit, what I call the digital darkroom. One is you are maybe making the image come to life. Um, so I'll, let's say if I'm shooting a lifestyle ad campaign, I may want to warm that up a little bit. Maybe having the right color temperature, white balance, when I shot it was great. But now I now I want to match or I want to warm the tones up a little bit. Or maybe I want to crop a little bit. Maybe I want to do something to, again, draw some attention to, as I mentioned earlier on, the hero or the, the point of the, of the story in the most important part of the story and the frame and where I want people to look. So that's really where the digital darkroom comes in. The second one is if you're doing compositing or you're doing you know a lot of different work, uh, if you're editing a, an event or a wedding photographer or something, you have hundreds of images to go through. Not Nothing comes out of the camera looking perfect. And especially if you're shooting raw, a raw image is not an image, actually. It's a data format. It's like saying, hey, I'm going to send you a Word document. If you don't have Word, it doesn't do you any good. So a raw image is an unprocessed data file. So therefore, you have to do something with it, and it's required. Um, which is what you want to do. You don't want the camera making those choices. You want to make those choices. Anyway, that's the point about that. And so, yes, you really do need to do some processing. It doesn't have to be a lot. You can create some automatic processes to do this. Um, but for the most part, you need to do some manipulation of those images once they come out of the camera because you don't want the camera making those choices for you. Okay. Um, so. Um, Got a question here or a comment, I think. Uh, let's see here. This is from, um, oops, I think it was. Where would it go? There we go. Yeah, from Jeff Fitzgerald. It says, I've learned more in this episode than years worth of YouTube. Great info. Thanks very much, Jeff. I appreciate it. That's the goal here, buddy, is to try and uh, educate people and uh, answer their questions directly with honest and straightforward answers the best, uh, to my, uh, the best of my ability. Dusty has a great question. She says, can you explain bracketing or BKT, bracketing function button on my camera? Absolutely. So, Dusty, the bracketing function allows you to, sh to shoot. It's actually kind of an interesting technique. It allows you to shoot multiple frames and, and bracket the exposure. So, for example, when you go into your camera, you can set this up of how you want it to work. For Let's say the most part, the simplest would be once you want to do, you want it to shoot a normal frame. In other words, whatever the camera thinks the exposure should be. 
then you want to shoot a frame one stop underexposed, and then you want it to shoot a frame that's one stop overexposed. So what you do is when you have your camera on, um, you can do it manually or you don't have to do it automatic. But so you, what you do is you have it on bracket, you hit the button once, it's going to shoot a normal frame. You hit a button again, it's going to shoot one frame below, one stop underexposed. You shoot a button again, hit the button again, it's going to shoot one stop overexposed. So you're going to get, th and you can do this multiple times. It'll actually, most cameras will do three, five, seven, and even nine frames, um, which is kind of excessive. But if you're not sure, let's say you're shooting a wedding and you're not really, you know, a lot of people talk about shooting on manual, which don't get me started. That's a whole nother issue that gripes me. But if you're not sure and you have it on bracket and you want to be safe, let's say you're shooting something that's super critical and you don't know if you're, you're going to get the exposure right, you can put it on bracket and boom, 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 hit three buttons, three, three shots. And now you're going to get three different exposures for that image. And so now you have some safeties. We used to do that quite often with film because again, you got a light meter, but you didn't have a preview, right? You didn't have a way to see if you got the image right. And if it was super critical and you needed to make sure you could shoot one image underexposed and one image overexposed and then one normal image or what the camera thought was normal. And then you got a little bit of what we call safeties there or images that give you to, to kind of back you up. So that's one way. Now, another thing that people do, a lot of people refer to this as HDR, high dynamic range, which it sort of is. There's another way you can do this, which instead of doing exposure on your bracketing, you can go into your camera and say, I want you to change uh, maybe uh, the, the, you can have it change the um, shutter speed instead of the, the exposure. And I think you can even, on some cameras, you can even have it bracket the white balance, which seems kind of silly to me, but I guess you could do that if you want. I've never actually used that button. So what happens, let's say you're doing real, this is very, very common in the real estate market. What will happen is you'll set up on a tripod, you'll bracket. Let's say you're going to do five frames on bracketing. You shoot one, it shoots maybe two stops under, one stop under, then a normal one, and then um, one stop over, and then two stops over. That's five, two, five, yeah, probably more than that. Anyway, that's five, I think. Um, so anyway, the point is that that gives you bracket. So now what you do is you bring those exposures into uh, Photoshop or Lightroom or some software. There's a bunch of free software, and it will merge those together, and it will then take the properly exposed image from the window, for example, and only use that and merge that together with the other image from the interior that looks great. So there, so that's one technique for using its uh, bracketing. But for the most part, the uh, bracketing button was originally designed just to be able to shoot one or two stops under, one or two stops over as a safety measure in case you weren't sure of your exposure setting. I hope that answered your question. So great question, by the way, Dusty. Thanks very much for joining us tonight and for asking that question. That's a good one. Um, see, these are, uh, I, this is what I love about this. And I know you guys think I'm crazy, but I forget about this stuff. I mean, I just know it to take it for granted because I've been, been doing it so long. So when Dusty asks a question like this, it's really beneficial to me because it reminds me of the things that I need to tell you guys about and I need to educate you on. So you're doing me a favor by asking these questions and I really enjoy answering them. I hope you. I hope they give you some pleasure and hope they help you in your, your photography. But it's great because, again, I totally forget about this stuff. And I forget these are kind of questions that, that are not obvious to a lot of people. So thank you, Dusty, and also Jeff for answering, for uh, chiming in there. I appreciate it. Okay, so let's go back here. So the other one is, so we did the editing one. And again, if you have any more, uh, more questions... Uh, again, just go ahead and be sure and put those in the um, um, comment section of the Facebook, of Facebook or YouTube, and I'll be glad to answer those. And if you put a cue in front of them, that makes it easier for me to have them to show up here on my screen. So anyway, okay. So the other question was it was, it was some submitted on September fourth, and as I, you guys aren't familiar, I'm going back through some of the old questions that we did for 2020. I had about 800 questions that were submitted. So I figured it'd be kind of fun to go back through some of the more popular ones and common ones that get asked a lot. So the next question is, um, this must be asked before. Yes, it probably was. What advice would you consider as a valuable lesson you've learned over the years in photography? Um, don't start 
a live Facebook stream every week. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's a lot of work. People don't realize how much work's involved in this. Uh, you know, so, so uh, a little, little stressful, but I enjoy doing it, especially when I get questions like Jeff and, and Dusty. Those are very, those make me uh, feel like it's worth it. Um, to answer your question, um, it would be, there's a, I could, there's a lot of them I could give you. One of them is, um, and this has kind of stuck with me my entire career, not just in photography. But um, at one point, I had the uh, I had the pleasure of um, I was working for a, a portrait studio. We did portraits and um, weddings. This was way back when, many many years ago, decades ago. And I had the ability to go to a um, uh, two weeks, and believe it or not, Winona, Indiana. Now, Winona, Indiana, had a school that was run by Kodak. And I spent two weeks with a bunch of Kodak professors, photographers, whatever you want to call them. And these guys were just fantastic. I learned so much. And one of the lessons I learned was to approach a subject from multiple angles. Don't, you know, when I, when you first think about something, you see an object, oh, that looks really interesting. You approach it and you start taking a picture of it, let's say. Well, there's, I've discovered in my own photography, there's something about that that drew, drew me to that picture. But the problem is when I first see it, that may not be the picture that I think is there. So what you want to do is you want to shoot it from multiple angles. If you can move over here, move over here, get up, get down, look down on it, whatever the subject may be, and try and approach the subject from multiple viewpoints. In fact, the other thing that they'll teach, they'll tell you, there's a 360 kind of rule if you can. You can try and go around this the object in 360 degrees and look at and shoot at from different angles. The other one is to look behind you because, you know, sometimes you're looking over here and you're shooting and you may not realize it, but there's something maybe more interesting behind you. Let's say you're shooting a sunset, really pretty. But if you turn around, the light from the sunset may be illuminating something behind you that you're not even seeing. So that's probably one of the most, and the reason I've, kept it in my entire career is I've used that philosophy in solving problems of any kind. It could be, you know, a, a business problem. Okay. Here's a solution or here's a problem. How do we solve it? Let's look at it from every angle possible. Now I've kind of taken an expand on it. What I look at is, okay, pretend I have all the money in the world, all the time in the world, all the resources in the world. Now what's the best solution for solving that problem? Okay. Maybe come up with a, with a list of items. Now, all right, now let's go back and apply the restrictions that we have. Okay, I don't have this. I don't have that. We don't have the money. We don't have the time. But now you whittle it down. But it doesn't, that way you don't, you're not prevented from coming up with the most creative idea. So let's apply this to photography for a second. I always tell people photography is a compromise. You never have enough money. You never have enough time. You never have enough gear. You never have... It's just, it's just the way a light, it's always the way it is, but your job as a photographer, especially if you're doing this as a career, you're doing this professionally is to solve that problem. So how do you solve that problem without having all the time, money, gear, light to do that? Okay. That's our job. So we are problem solvers. And that was one of the things I learned, probably the most valuable thing I learned coming out of this Kodak school was how to approach problems differently. And like I said, that stuck with me my whole career and it's, uh, it's, a, you know, basic troubleshooting basic, but I love that part about the job. I have to tell you, um, when it's, when you have to think on your feet in front of a client and it's a big, you know, commercial job I'm doing or something, some kind of ad or something and something breaks or something happens, um, being able to solve that problem on the fly is my favorite part of the job without letting the client even know there's a problem. So I could, I have many, many war stories I could tell you about that. We're not going to go into that tonight. So, all right, let's keep going here. All right. So on September 11th, I had a question that said, uh, when I post my photos to Instagram or Facebook, they seem to change a bunch and they aren't crisp and clear. Any ideas? Yes. Lots of ideas. First of all, um, try and use a PNG format, not a JPEG format. And the reason is a JPEG format is a compressed 
and, I, and I'm going to use some terms here. I know it's not going to make sense. It's in a compressed 8-bit format. An, a PNG is a little bit larger file. It's not as compressed, and it will retain more of the color and the, and, and the quality. But here's the key. The key is don't upload images that are either low resolution or high resolution. Like, well, what does that mean, Lee? Look at what the native resolution, the platform is that you're, uh, you're uploading to. I think, I, I think last time I looked, Facebook was like 2048. I may be wrong about that. That was the, that was the, the, the pixel width that they were looking for. So resize your image for Facebook or for Instagram in, in another program like Photoshop or Luminar or Lightroom, and then upload the image using that size. And then you then the reason that you want to do that is then Facebook isn't resizing it. It's not blowing it up. It's not compressing it. It's not, uh, it will compress it, but it won't reduce it quite as much. And it also will not um, take, if you have a high resolution image and you upload it, it's going to reduce it and use its own algorithm, which may not, and it's probably not as um, going to be as good as yours. Let's keep in mind, these guys have gazillions of images uploaded every single day. So for them, the criteria is not quality. The criteria is disk space. So they're trying to save as much space as possible. So they're going to compress that image the best they can to make some kind of compromise there and get the best image quality or decent image quality, but mainly save space. And so you want to kind of try and cheat that a little bit by making sure the image is the size they're expecting it to be uploaded. Okay. Um, let's see what Dusty says here. There's another question. I think it's a question. Let's see, Dusty, what do you got here? Dusty says, I appreciate um, all you do to help us keep Facebook Live <laughs> going. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's awful kind of you. Dusty's great. I've talked to her many times, and uh, she's a very good photographer and improving every day, which is tremendous. I love seeing people grow as photographers. and um, so thank you very much. It's awful nice of you to say. Okay. Um, so again, so that's the deal on Facebook and uploading images to Facebook. Okay. On September 18th, and um, the, one of the questions I got was, when I try to use the camera in manual, the pictures turn out so dark. Why? Because you listen to these morons on Facebook. Oh, God, this drives me nuts. I'm so sorry. I know, I know there's, this is a, a controversial topic with a lot of people. But I have to tell you, if you're a new photographer, do not shoot on manual. Do not shoot on manual. Let me repeat that in case you didn't hear me. Do not shoot on manual. <laughs> now, there are times to shoot on manual. I'm going to counter that. But let me explain to you what the issue is here. When you shoot on manual, you now have to determine the shutter speed. You have to determine the aperture. And you have to determine the ISO. All three of those. Well, if you don't understand how those interrelate and you shoot on manual, then you're guessing, okay, what's the right f-stop? What's the right shutter speed? What's the right ISO? You don't know. And any, you got gazillion, I don't know how many, what the math would be for combinations of those three things, but it's got to be high. So if you try and shoot, if you put the camera on aperture priority and, and pick what the aperture, the opening is, then that will tell the camera, okay, I'm going to lock in this aperture. Let's say it's going to be f8. It says I'm going to shoot at f8. Okay, got it. Now you that's telling the camera you pick the best shutter speed, and if you're using auto ISO, which I recommend in some cases you do, then it will also automatically pick the proper ISO for that image. So there's a light meter in the camera, and the light meter in the camera is measuring all this stuff. These things are very sophisticated. It's looking at the entire scene and it's trying to determine what's the proper exposure. Well, by going on manual, you're basically defeating the light meter. You might as well be using a 1963 film camera, a manual film camera, because you've turned everything off. So you spend all this money on this nice camera, and then you turn off all the features, and it doesn't make sense. The other thing is, here's the other thing people don't realize. A properly, keyword properly, a properly exposed image will look exactly the same on manual as it does on aperture priority, shutter priority, or even auto. It doesn't matter. The settings don't make the image better. It's how the settings are set up and how they interact. So in other words, if I go to auto and I take a picture, and I, I do this quite often actually, mainly aperture priority, but I auto and I look at the picture and it says, okay, they said that the light meter said 
This is at F8 at 250th of a second at ISO 100. Great. I go to manual. I put in F8, shutter speed at 250, ISO 100. I'm going to get the exact same picture. Exactly. So what's the difference? You're not, you know, what happens, the mistake people make, and I'm sorry, this is, I said this was a rant. The mistake is you get these yahoos on Facebook and say, oh, you got to shoot on manual. What they're really tr saying, they're not saying you need to shoot on manual. That's what they're actually articulating. But they're, what they're really trying to tell you is you need to understand the relationship between shutter, aperture, and ISO what's referred to as the exposure triangle, which is not really, I don't think a great term, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, that's what they're trying to tell you, but they're not saying that they're saying that you got to shoot on manual. So if you're just starting out, do not shoot on manual, use aperture priority and then watch your shutter speed. This, the, the, everything applies the same, right? So in other words, you're just picking one of the options and letting the camera pick the other two. So, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't be embarrassed by shooting on auto if you have to. Don't be embarrassed by shooting on shutter. So here's an example why you may shoot on shutter speed. Well, I could really spend a lot of time on this, couldn't I? <laughs> uh, let me back up. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I shoot 90% of the time on aperture priority. And I've been shooting for over 30 years. And every professional I know shoots on aperture priority. And I know people will, agree, will disagree. Oh, I, you know, I don't shoot on that. I'm a pro and I don't shoot. I shoot on manual. Okay, here I shoot on manual sometimes too, but here's the issue. Why do I shoot on aperture priority? The reason I shoot on aperture priority is because I am trying to dictate, I am trying to determine the depth of field. How much information do I want in focus versus how much I want out of focus? So here's two scenarios. One, I'm on a magazine assignment. I go into this shop. I'm supposed to take a picture of this person for an article. The question is, is the article about this guy as a shop owner or is the article about the guy that, or because the guy saved a cat from a tree? If he's a shop owner, then I want to include some of that background. I might, I want to have some depth of field there. I may want to shoot at five, six, F eight, whatever. So therefore I want to make sure that's determined because that's a, one of the most creative processes and creative tools I have to work with. But if the guy saved a cat from a tree, then I don't, the background where I have to shoot may be busy. I don't want, it's distracting. It's not going back to telling the story. I was telling, as I mentioned earlier. So I want to throw that out of focus. So then I want to use a wider aperture, five, six, three, five, one, four, whatever it may be. But that's the quest. That's a creative decision I'm making. I don't care what the shutter speed is. I care. And the ISO, but the, the app, the depth of field is the most important thing to helping me tell that story because I'm trying to either use the background or remove the background. That's why I shoot on aperture priority. Now, when do I shoot on manual? When the light never changes. If I'm in the studio and I'm using strobes, I shoot on manual. Why? Cause I lock it in. I use my light meter or I set up my, uh, you know, do some, exp um, do some tests. Boom. It's uh, the lighting's never going to change. It's exactly the same. If I, when I was doing concert photography, okay, I don't want the lighting to change, uh, be on aperture, shutter, whatever. I want to, the lighting to be locked in. I'd meter on the, on the performer's face, and then I'd say that's stuck right there, and then I never change it. If I do have to change the exposure, there's a little button on the top of your camera called, well, I guess on the Nikon, it's on the top on the back, I think of a Canon. It's called, it's a plus or a minus, or it may have an EV next to it. That overrides exposure. You hold that button down and turn the knob, depending on your camera, that will take an over and raised exposure or lower exposure. So you can, even if you're shooting on aperture priority and you need to make a change, you don't even have to change your aperture shutter speed. Just hit that EV button and make a quick change and that will automatically correct, go up or down without you changing the rest of the settings on your camera. Anyway, not intended to get into a exposure triangle camera processing system here. But it's important that you understand that manual can get you in trouble if you don't know what you're doing. So do not shoot on manual if you're just starting out. It's not going to improve your photos. Start on aperture priority. And then if now the other question is make sure your shutter speed is not too low, which is a whole nother issue. So anyway, whew, well, that was a rant one. I apologize, but it just drives me nuts because I see so many people doing this. And then they get the question like this, why my picture's dark? Why are they overexposed? Because you're just guessing at what the exposure is by shooting on manual instead of letting this 
expensive camera that you bought do some of the work for you. All right. Okay, and we're going to go over a little bit tonight, if you guys don't mind. I want to get to these, and I uh, I think it's important, and because this is the last show of the uh, year, we'll, uh, we'll go a little further. Okay, so the next question was uh, on October 16th. It says, uh, any suggestions for those building your portfolio? What do you charge? How long is the session? So portfolio building is kind of an interesting thing. Um, you can do some free sessions. You can, people say, I want to do a mini session. Um, what I would, there's... Here's the problem with building a portfolio. The first thing is you got to make sure your portfolio represents the kind of work you want to get hired to shoot. I assume this is they're looking to do this for money, right? I mean, it's the way based the question is based. So therefore, you can get free people to shoot for free, or you can do many sessions or whatever dollar. I don't care whatever the question, the the price is. The point is, is that the kind of work you want people to hire you to do? So, for example, if you do not want to get hired to do uh, um, weddings, nothing against weddings, but if you do, and then you do a friend's wedding for free and then you post those images, um, guess what's going to happen? They're going to call you to do weddings. So if you're building your portfolio, be specific, look at the type of work you want to get hired to do, and then shoot that kind of stuff. I am a big proponent of personal projects. So here's the scenario. Instead of going out and doing a, a, a shoot for $99, $20, whatever the price may be to build your portfolio, and then you have a client and you have to work and you have to process the images and you have to deliver them, et cetera, et cetera. That may be fine if you're looking to do a testimonial, but what about this? What about this scenario? Why not find a friend or hire a model for that $20 or whatever it's going to cost or trade them images? And come up with your own project. Shoot your own project. Come up with something out of your own head. Find a location. Say, this is a really cool location. I'd love to do something here. Come up with a concept. Come up with two or three ideas. Get this person, a friend, a model, or whatever to come over there. And you shoot that location. For And, may, and you be the creative director. You come up with the idea. You shoot what you want to shoot. Now, there's no pressure. So why shoot something for free? and have to deal with the pressure and the details of having somebody else tell you what they want and how they want it. When, if you're doing it for free, why don't you shoot it for yourself? Go out and build your own portfolio with your own work, with your own concepts. It's going to be more creative. You're going to be more flexible and you don't have the pressure. So that's the first thing. If you are doing some other work for clients and nothing wrong with that, I mean, you can put that in your portfolio. All I'm saying is just make sure it's the right kind of work that's the kind of stuff you want to demonstrate. Also, I would tell you, do not put too many images in your portfolio. I would rather see you have five images, 10 images, 15 images, instead of 20 or 30 or 40 images that are, that are mediocre. Only put your best work in there. Even if there are five images, just show off those five and only show the best of the best. Because what's going to happen is you'll go back six months, look at those images and you go, oh my gosh. What was I thinking? These are awful. Maybe hopefully, because hopefully you're going to progress. So you'll continue to improve and you don't want to, you'll want to rotate those out as you get better and better. Okay. All right. So that's a long route about, um, about doing, um, portfolio work. Hope that helped. Okay. So blue asks, here's just some uh, current questions. Blue asks, I'm curious if anyone offers a client appreciation or book, um, or, Booking gift bag, and if so, what do they put in them? Um, I I don't know about the 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 uh, booking gift bag blue. I'll be honest with you, but what I will tell you is, from a, from a customer support, a customer appreciation standpoint, um, it's so easy to step out and differentiate yourself because pe the the customer support for most people nowadays is awful. I mean, it's just terrible. So all you got to do is be mediocre. And do a little bit and it'll make a big difference. So the first thing I'd tell you is you want to do a handwritten note. Send it to them, thanking them for their uh their time, thanking them for their the you know their family and in that you how much you enjoyed working with them and uh, that type of thing. So that's the first thing. That will mean more to somebody as far as appreciation than a gift bag or I think or uh, some kind of trinket. I mean, I get those kinds of things for subscribing to this or that and the other, and they're fine, 
but you know, I don't usually ever use them. I mean, it's a nice, uh, g the gesture, I appreciate the gesture more than I appreciate the actual item that they send. Um, so that's the point that what you're keep your, your eye on the ball. And that is what's the point, what's the purpose of doing a, a good, a appreciation or a booking gift bag. And that is to show them their that your thanks. And that can be done in a number of different ways, but mainly being personable, being appreciative, being grateful and letting them know that will be uh, enough. And I don't say just vision. I'm not just saying just do that in, per, um, you know, just in hand in person or send them an email. I'm saying do something in writing that will make you stand out. I think it'd be helpful. All right. Um, next one is from Chinny Chetta, Chet, Chetty. Um, boy, I can, I'm sorry. I apologize if I'm not getting your name right. I know I'm not. Um, a question for those in family portraits. What sort of props do you invest in for outdoor portraits? Um, I like props. I've used them a number of times for actually commercial magazine work, believe it or not. Um, the re the depends though. Um, here's, you got to figure out what the purpose of the prop is. I use props for two reasons, maybe three. The first reason I use a prop is if it's some, most of the time we're photographing, even uh, as a professional, I'm photographing people that are not necessarily comfortable in front of the camera. So I'm trying to get them to relax. I want them to let their guard down. So I will give them something to do um, with their hands or to, to as a warm up thing. Um, I wish I had a picture here I could show you. I know I have one somewhere um, of a shoot that I did. And you want to get them where they're not thinking about the camera. That's the first person, first reason for using a prop, especially if you're doing children, that kind of thing. The second thing of using a prop is you want to use it as a storytelling tool. You want to help reinforce the, the story or the couple. Um, excuse me. Or something like that. So that would be the second reason for a prop is that you want to help use it to help reinforce the story. And, um, the third reason could just be, you know, just for whatever. I mean, it just you just want to have something fun to do, throw something in there. Like sometimes if it's a business portrait, I'll have people hold their glasses or hold a pen because they want to do something with their hand. And so they're, they're uncomfortable um, and they don't know what to do with their hand. Should I, they'll ask you, should I put them in my pocket? Should I fold them? What should I? So if you give them something to do with their hands, that will typically help. And so you can use props for that purpose as well. Okay. So, um, Malika, 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 uh, I'm trying to learn Photoshop. Good luck with that. Uh, what good, what good things to do on it? Oh, I don't know if that, what that question exactly means, but I don't know if that means learning Photoshop. Here's the problem with Photoshop. It's a great program, but it's, it's really a lot. You gotta remember Photoshop was developed as a photo compositing and image manipulation tool. It's not meant, it was never designed as a photo management tool. That's what Lightroom does. Lightroom will manage, I have over 250,000 images in my Lightroom catalog. You don't do that in Photoshop. Photoshop is a compositing tool. It's used to, you basically use it to create one image, you manipulate it, and then you save that one image and that's it. It's kind of baked. Um, I could go into the difference, but that's not the point. The point that with with Photoshop is there's probably nine ways to do the exact same thing. I could do one way. Dusty could maybe learn a different way. Jeff might have learned a different way. But wait, the results are exactly the same. So you go on YouTube or you go on some training site and you say, how do I do X, Y, Z? And everybody has a different way of doing it. So that's what make one of the things that makes it difficult to learn. Now, what's the right way? The right way is the most efficient way. The right way is the way you can do it. Whichever method you select is the fastest and the most efficient. Cause you don't want to be spending days working in Lightroom. You want to get this quick. So for me, I've been using it so long. I don't even know how, when I teach people Lightroom or Photoshop, the hardest thing for me is remembering what menus to use because I'd use, I use keystrokes. If I want to duplicate a layer in Photoshop. I just know on the Mac that's command J that's going to create another layer. You know, so I don't even know. I know it's in there somewhere. File, probably duplicate, copy something. Maybe you can right click on it. 
but I, but so that's the problem. So, but that's the reason I do this because it's very efficient. It's very fast for me. And therefore I can move through images very quickly. So, um, there's a, I, there's a, a site called Flern, F L E A R N dot com, and that's one of the, some of the best uh, compositing photo manipulation sites. But there's a bunch of them out there. I mean, the product's been around for a long time. Okay, the next question is from Emma. Um, how do you guys go about uh, starting your own photography business and getting clients? I've been trying to get clients. Emma, run. Run quickly, run in the other direction. Do not do this, whatever you do. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, it's it's tough business. Um, first of all, let me tell you, Emma, that one of the misconceptions about photography business is that it's not about photography. Um, it is 80% business and 20% photography, unfortunately. Now, that's not what you want to hear because that's not why we get into the photography business. We get all of us, I think pretty much go into the photography business because we love to create. We love doing photography. And we think if we do this as a living, we're going to be able to do it all the time. This is great. I can be a photographer and I can just do this 24 seven roughly. That's not what happens. What happens though, is you spend 80% of your time, just what you're saying, looking for clients, marketing, then they're interested and you have to talk with them. You have to give them a proposal, pricing, whatever, the locations, model releases, on and on and on, taxes. Um, it's just, there's a lot to it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's part of the job, but the thing is, it is a job. And so that's the first thing you got to remember is that it, there's a lot of work involved in like anything else. As far as getting clients, um, I know this is going to sound like a cliche, and obvious, but you got to go where your clients are. In other words, if I'm a, so for me as an advertising commercial photography photographer, my clients are, I mean, they're not really on Facebook. I mean, there's probably some on Instagram. They'll probably look me up on Instagram once they look at my website, but my clients are advertising agencies. So I have to go where advertising agencies hang out and that's either directly to them or to a photo reviews in New York or things like that. So you have to figure out, first of all, what kind of photography you want to shoot and get hired to do. The second thing is you want to go where your clients are and you put your work in front of them. And then the third thing is you want to be known for something. So um, one of the mistakes I see people make is they will, um, they'll put on their website, portraits, family, wedding, product, sports, you know, destination. I mean, they'll, they'll have all these different categories on there. So people come to your website. And by the way, I recommend you have a website. Facebook is fine, but you want a dedicated website with your URL, your domain name on there and your email on there. Um, that's the other thing. Um, but so they'll come to your website and you want to look in there and say, Oh, okay. I see. We'll just pick on dusty here for a second. Dusty is a portrait photographer. Wow. I love her work. That's great. I'm going to call her cause I need a business portrait or, you know, maybe there's, maybe I'm looking for a wedding photographer. I don't want to go on a site that has a whole bunch of stuff and then one little section for weddings. And here's my analogy. And this is a little extreme. Okay. I'll admit you wouldn't go to a gas station and buy sushi. Would you? Hopefully not. And you wouldn't go to an Italian restaurant and order uh, Japanese or Chinese food. You go to a specialty place. You when you you look it up or you want to go to a place you think, oh, these guys have the best sushi. So you go to a sushi bar, right? Because that's what they're known for. You want to do the same thing. You and I'm not saying you have to only do one thing, but what I am saying is you want to be known for something. You want to be known for doing this kind of work. Oh, you know, Emma is just amazing. Her portrait work is fantastic. You really want to go to her if you need a portrait done. That's the kind of thing you want to get known for. Again. Now I'll tell you, I do a lot of different kinds of photography, but it's not on my website. Okay. I do product photography. I've done many, many product photography jobs for big clients. Um, architecture work. I've done some of that kind of stuff. I've done remodel, you know, people that are doing, want to submit work to magazines. I've done interior work for like, uh, uh, I did a photo shoot for a bath on a bathroom, believe it or not. The remodeling, not my, not my fee, but the work done on the remodeling was a hundred thousand dollars just to remodel his bathroom. And they wanted to submit the work to a magazine. I shot that. Okay. But you'll never find that on my website. Doesn't mean I can't shoot it. Doesn't mean I don't know how to shoot it, 
I obviously know how to shoot it, but the problem is I don't want, that's not the kind of stuff I'd necessarily want to get hired to do. So that's what, the, that's the point. You want to be known for something and you want to specialize at least somewhat uh, so that people know you for that kind of work. So I hope that helps him. I don't know. It's um, or not. Okay. That is our last question for tonight. And I guess that would be for the year. I, um, I really want to thank you guys. It's, it's great. Been doing this. I've been doing this now for, I don't know, 16, eight, I don't know how many weeks, months. It's again, I looked it up. I think I started in July, mid July. Um, and, um, it's, um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been great. I didn't, you know, I'm used to being behind the camera, quite frankly, I'm not used to being in front of the camera. So it's a little odd, even though I, uh, have experience in video and stuff like that, being in front of the camera is a whole nother, whole nother deal. And, um, that's one thing I, I'd love to do for, that'd be my goal for 2021 is to get rid of the word. Um, I use that way too much anyway. So I appreciate your time again. Let me remind you one more time. If uh, I'm going to be doing a, um, a free workshop, a Lightroom workshop in January. I have not gotten that date set yet. Um, but if you want to be able to be a part of that, go to photomentoracademy.com. I apologize again. I don't have a dedicated sign up page for this um, site yet. But just fill out your name and email, and I'll notify you with the details. And I'm going to be covering a number of different topics. But just a few of them are going to be image management, how you deal with your images, where they store, that type of thing. Um, best practices on storage, on backups and stuff like that. Some basic editing techniques and exporting tips and tricks. Probably how to do um, watermarks, which is a very common question. So go to photomentoracademy.com and uh, I'll notify you when that is available. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. And the, uh, I know it's a big demand. Like I said before, a lot of people have had trouble with this, which is why I decided to offer this because I think it would be very helpful to a lot of you. And that's my goal. So again, I guess, uh, one more thing, let me just finish one more thing. And then before I say good, good night, and that is remind you of the things or some possible goals for 2021. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. That's the first thing. Um, you are your own person. Just don't worry about what other people uh, are doing. And, um, you know, tell, don't take photos, tell stories. That's another thing. I want you to try and be a goal for 2021. Spend more time in front of the camera or behind the camera instead of in front of the computer. You know, look at the, the images, shoot more, de, de, uh, uh, shoot more intently don't try and shoot something that's just you know, you know you can quote unquote fix and post because that's not the way to do it and avoid gas which is gear acquisition syndrome it's a common problem we all have but it's easy to get into where you're collecting a bunch of gear you think equipment's going to solve the problem and it will not so again thanks very much and um, look forward to uh, seeing you in January with a lot of new cool things I'm going to be working on and uh, listen, everybody have a wonderful Christmas and a great new year. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.